We hear a lot about intelligence in the abstract, but what is intelligence and how is it actually produced? Well, this occurs through what is known as the intelligence cycle. It is the process of gathering intelligence and using it to inform decision making. The first step in the intelligence process is planning and direction, including direction from public officials, law enforcement and other agency supervisors, the National Security Council, and other stakeholders with intelligence requests. This is where the purpose and intention of the intelligence is first stated. The second step is collecting raw information from confidential or publicly available sources and collating that information, organizing it into a database where it can be retrieved by analysts, which then leads to the third step. Analysis, reducing the large amount of information collected and converting it into intelligence. This involves interpreting, integrating, and evaluating the context of the information collected. Who is involved? What is going on? What does it mean? It is where conclusions are drawn, their implications are described, and predictions are made. The fourth step is disseminating the intelligence. Where finished intelligence products are produced, written or verbal briefs, routine summaries, and then provided to end users. Those who originally requested the intelligence in the initial planning and direction, among others who will benefit from it, to inform their decision making. These end users then provide feedback on the intelligence in the form of guidance on how to proceed with further intelligence gathering, and the cycle begins all over again. Now, while this basic intelligence model is useful, and there are numerous variations of it, it is, at the same time, simplistic. The intelligence cycle is not so straightforward in practice. There are many ways it can be disrupted, prevented from functioning the way it should. Many intelligence failures have occurred throughout U.S. history, some of which have resulted in a tremendous loss of life. For example, similarities could be drawn between the 9-11 terrorist attacks and the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941. While there are notable differences, and the extent of the direct similarities has been debated, it offers a useful historical comparison because both Pearl Harbor and 9-11 involved surprise attacks that could have been prevented if not for intelligence failures, and both resulted in reforms of U.S. intelligence gathering and sharing processes. As the U.S. moved toward World War II, President Franklin Roosevelt recognized that government agencies were not good at sharing intelligence and created the Office of Coordinator of Information in July 1941 as the first peacetime domestic intelligence coordinating agency. However, this was not sufficient to prevent the attacks on December 7, 1941. Pearl Harbor was viewed by many as a massive failure to collect and share necessary intelligence, in large part due to bureaucratic inefficiencies that stood in the way. In other words, a lot of bureaucratic red tape prohibited intelligence sharing. A subsequent congressional investigation found 25 deficiencies contributing to the attacks. These deficiencies should look familiar as many mirror intelligence failures in the lead up to 9-11. Pearl Harbor demonstrated a need for the coordination of intelligence. At this time, the FBI, Army, Navy, and other intelligence units still held intelligence pretty close to the chest. They weren't equipped or willing to share it. These intelligence failures resulted in numerous changes to intelligence operations during World War II, but the most consequential occurred after the war ended with the 1947 National Security Act, which entirely restructured the U.S.'s military and intelligence agencies. The Office of Strategic Services, created by President Roosevelt out of the former Office of Coordinator of Information in 1942, was morphed into the U.S.'s Foreign Intelligence Service, the Central Intelligence Agency, CIA. The act also brought together all branches of the U.S. military under the Department of Defense, led by a new cabinet-level secretary. The National Security Council was also created, which advises the President on national security and foreign policy matters. Then we fast forward to 9-11, another major U.S. intelligence failure. In response, the 2002 Homeland Security Act reoriented the government's response to terrorism and other emergencies, which we discussed at length last week. Two years later, the 2004 Intelligence Reform and Terrorism Prevention Act further called for improved sharing of information, interagency cooperation and collaboration, access to intelligence by relevant stakeholders, and increased awareness and training. It created the position of Director of National Intelligence, or DNI, to oversee the entire intelligence community, previously run by the CIA director, who now reports to the DNI. It also established the National Counterterrorism Center, which operates under the DNI and maintains counterterrorism databases accessible by intelligence community agencies. So what exactly is the intelligence community, and what do they do? 
Well, the intelligence community, originally established in 1981 by President Ronald Reagan, is a massive federation of 18 U.S. government agencies from the Departments of Defense, Homeland Security, Justice, State, Treasury, Energy, and the CIA, responsible for working individually and collectively to gather, produce, and share foreign and domestic intelligence. It also includes civilian intelligence analysts, such as private contractors, working for these federal agencies. This is how a consultant in 2013 was able to obtain and release classified information about the NSA's bulk data collection programs. More on this next week. Along with the DNI and intelligence community, international cooperative agreements, the United Nations, and international law enforcement coordinating agencies, such as Interpol, have all worked together to strengthen coordination, intelligence sharing, and joint investigations of terrorism and other transnational crime, with varying degrees of success. In addition to the creation of the Department of Homeland Security and the Director of National Intelligence, substantial changes were made to the FBI as well. Prior to 9-11, the FBI was really peripheral to the intelligence community, acting largely on their own accord. There was a lack of bottom-up sharing of intelligence from FBI field offices to headquarters and a focus on reactive law enforcement rather than proactive, preventative intelligence gathering. The FBI took a big hit after the attacks in terms of their credibility. There was broad skepticism of their ability to prevent terrorism or thwart another attack. After 9-11, counterterrorism became the FBI's top priority, and the agency began a fundamental shift from a traditional law enforcement agency to a domestic intelligence agency with both law enforcement and national and homeland security missions. More on this later. Much like the FBI, state and local law enforcement agencies were expected to become more intelligence-driven and focus more on homeland security. State and local law enforcement play a crucial role in the intelligence cycle. They are essentially the boots on the ground, with an opportunity to come across important information through their routine interactions and duties that no one else in the intelligence community has the ability to identify and share. But they need to know how to recognize information that could be used to thwart terrorist plots and who to share it with. After 9-11, it was discovered that several of the hijackers came into contact with local law enforcement. There was a realization that important information relevant to counterterrorism was not being shared. There was a need for a bi-directional flow of information. However, despite their crucial role, Homeland Security functions and intelligence capabilities were virtually non-existent before and immediately following the 9-11 attacks. The roughly 18,000 local agencies in the U.S. did not really focus on terrorism and were not trained to gather and share intelligence. The reason for this is largely because collecting and analyzing intelligence is not a traditional goal of policing. Traditional policing is reactive, reliant on calls for service. It's incident-based. Go to a call, clear it, move on to the next call. It also follows a hierarchical, bureaucratic, paramilitary model, relying on a similar rank system as the military with discipline and accountability to superior officers and a unidirectional flow of information from the top downward and random preventative vehicle patrol is standard. Traditional measures of officer and agency performance center on the number of tickets written, arrests made, and cases cleared. Other goals include avoiding public complaints, staying out of the press, and maintaining the organization so it is able to survive. This often means constantly struggling with constrained budgets and finding ways to secure additional funding. An alternative model that offers numerous ways for law enforcement to contribute to homeland security and terrorism prevention is community-oriented policing. Community policing at its core is based on the philosophy that law-abiding citizens should have input into policing in their communities, provided they are willing to participate in and support the effort. Community policing decentralizes police operations, giving more discretion to line-level officers to deal with the unique problems communities are facing and reduce fear of crime and terrorism by enhancing their quality of life. The police and community work together as problem solvers to identify, prioritize, and solve mutual problems, thus sharing similarities with another related policing model, problem-oriented policing. Police-community partnerships are key to community policing with two-way communication and information sharing. This information can be very useful to police, as community members may have direct knowledge about potential terrorist threats and those being radicalized near them. Another alternative model that builds on community policing and problem-oriented policing is intelligence-led policing. 
If community policing centers on building community partnerships, intelligence-led policing centers on intelligence largely stemming from those community partnerships. Intelligence-led policing involves gathering intelligence and using it to both assess crime patterns and prioritize where resources will be most effective at preventing and reducing the risk of crime and terrorism. It centers on two primary types of intelligence. Strategic intelligence focuses on gathering a broad array of information to assess both current and emerging threats, while tactical intelligence is case-specific, focusing on individuals and groups known to be actively involved in extremism that could eventually lead to crime or terrorism. Like community policing, it is most effective when the model permeates how the whole organization operates, rather than being restricted to a specific unit, and when it is concentrated on specific problems. This brings us to the many barriers to cultivating and sharing intelligence among law enforcement agencies. As mentioned earlier, it depends on partnerships and communication with communities, but many community members are reluctant to share information due to mistrust in the police, along with just general apathy to the efforts, which we'll discuss further next week. There are inconsistent standards and priorities across agencies, making it challenging to get them to work together in a cohesive and coherent way toward a common goal. Organizational culture is another barrier. It is difficult to change organizational subcultures. The traditional policing model is heavily ingrained, and it isn't an easy task to shift from a crime-fighting mentality to an intelligence-gathering or community-oriented mentality. Officers highly value their own instincts, training, and experience, and resist efforts to set those aside in favor of the results of an intelligence analysis. Another barrier is competing and sometimes conflicting strategies, including differing definitions and approaches for community and intelligence-based policing, resulting in a lack of clarity and uncertainty as to what they should actually be doing. The result is that strategies are implemented in a multitude of different ways, often inadequately, and their implementation and effectiveness are rarely properly evaluated. A natural response by many in law enforcement is to throw up their hands and return back to the quote-unquote tried-and-true approaches that they quote-unquote know to quote-unquote work. Inadequate personnel, training, resources, and time are further barriers limiting the intelligence capacity of state and local law enforcement. Extensive efforts have been made to attempt to overcome these barriers. Prior to 9-11, there were few multi-agency collaborative efforts focused on counterterrorism. One effort to change how the FBI engages with state and local law enforcement was the expansion of joint terrorism task forces. There are 103 nationwide, 71 of which were created after 9-11. They are overseen directly by the FBI and pull officers from across ranks at state, local, and federal law enforcement agencies to actively investigate terrorism cases and conduct surveillance, monitoring, and interviews. These task forces have coordinated many successful investigations and foiled numerous plots, but it should also be mentioned that they have been criticized for conducting monitoring and surveillance of those who do not seemingly pose a terrorist threat, such as protest and activist groups. We'll cover this more extensively next week. Much of the effort to build an intelligence-sharing infrastructure after 9-11 has centered around fusion centers, which focus on prevention and protection, identifying emerging threats, sharing actionable messages with end users in the public, and relaying information following attacks and other disasters. There are now 79 fusion centers nationwide operated at the state and local level as hub-and-spoke structures, where information flows back and forth from the hub, the fusion center, to the spokes, different end users, stakeholders like local police agencies. Tremendous resources have also gone toward developing new trainings and technologies and building relationships across agencies. That said, a great deal of criticism has been leveled at fusion centers over the years, including by citizens' rights groups and policymakers from both sides of the political aisle. One criticism is that the missions and leadership of fusion centers vary widely by state. Therefore, different priorities are represented. This is evidenced by the fact that few fusion centers focus exclusively on terrorism, while others have varying focuses, so there is a lack of uniformity. Inconsistent standards and priorities across agencies are also contributing factors. Another criticism is that intelligence facilitated by fusion centers does little to actually prevent future attacks, that the general intelligence reports coming from fusion centers are often not directly relevant to those who could best use them to make crucial decisions. This is likely because, in most cases, fusion center activities are dictated by end users, like police departments, who request information for specific investigations, so it ends up not being broadly applicable to the needs of other agencies. 
As a result, the intelligence is often not being used to assess and forecast emerging threats. This points to numerous additional ongoing intelligence-related concerns. One was mentioned last week in relation to Homeland Security and is also applicable here. The intelligence community and intelligence gathering apparatus in the U.S. in general have become so expansive that it is unclear exactly how many individuals, programs, and agencies are involved, how much all of these intelligence gathering efforts cost, or how effective they are at thwarting attacks. Effective oversight is lacking with jurisdiction over different aspects of Homeland Security and intelligence spread across dozens of congressional committees and subcommittees. Another concern is when intelligence is not properly vetted, when information essentially gets trapped, not shared with the trained professional agency analysts who need to examine it. Instead, raw information is funneled directly from the source to policymakers and practitioners without critical review from analysts who place it into the proper context necessary to interpret it. After all, without proper context, raw information could just end up amounting to unreliable noise. This is often referred to as stovepiping and it can result in poor decisions being made with wide-reaching negative consequences. This is a major part of the intelligence failures in the lead-up to the 2003 invasion of Iraq. Unvetted, inaccurate raw information alleging a cooperative relationship between al-Qaeda and the Iraqi government and Iraq's development of weapons of mass destruction was not properly analyzed and contextualized, but instead fed or piped directly to high-level Bush administration officials, largely due to pressure to produce intelligence supporting the administration's preferred course of action. This highlights the crucial distinction between intelligence-led policy and policy-led intelligence. Related persistent issues with gathering, vetting, and sharing intelligence remain. While numerous violent plots, including bombings and shootings, have been identified and stopped, some still fall through the cracks without all the pieces being put together in a way that could have prevented them. This points to how extraordinarily challenging it is to get the right intelligence to the right people who need it and can best take action based on that intelligence. Some of these concerns are an overload of information to sift through and the failure to act on intelligence that is generated or information that is readily available. This brings us to a recent incident that has the hallmarks of another major intelligence failure, the attack on the U.S. Capitol. Information sitting right out in the open for anyone to see was missed, including thousands of social media posts and comments openly discussing storming the U.S. Capitol on January 6th, which also received a fair amount of media coverage prior to the attack. The FBI has found itself again under scrutiny for failing to develop and share crucial intelligence related to the attack based on this information. Along with accusations of downplaying any prior coordination among the insurrectionists to cover for their failure to act. One source of confusion revolves around how extensively the FBI reviews open source information, like public social media accounts. FBI officials have stated they don't have the authority to review social media activity without a catalyst or trigger to open an official assessment, the initial stages of an investigation, such as through a formal tip. Which brings up an important question. Considering all the money, time, and effort gathering intelligence by embedding agents and turning informants within known extremist movements, the FBI doesn't have the authority to proactively look at Twitter or other online platforms and forums where extremists are known to communicate? On its face, this seems to contradict the post-9-11 mission of shifting the FBI from a traditional law enforcement agency to an intelligence-based agency, and conflicts with the Attorney General's guidelines for how the FBI are permitted to operate domestically. Part of the confusion appears to stem from FBI policy rather than DOJ policy or statute language. It certainly requires clarification at the very least. But regardless, it's important not to rush to any definitive conclusions before a complete investigation into the attack has been conducted, and it will be telling to see what, if any, additional reforms to intelligence processes of the FBI or other intelligence community agencies result from these ongoing investigations. That said, one of the major reasons crucial information may have been missed, aside from the massive amount of information to sift through and the challenge of separating a credible threat from typical online chatter and bravado, also points to major concerns over domestic surveillance, spying, intruding on the privacy and civil liberties of citizens, including First Amendment rights to free speech and assembly, which we'll discuss at length when we address the challenge of balancing the needs of security, civil liberties, and human rights. Until then, have a good one.